On March 31, 1990, Stephen Marfio contacted the Johnston Police Department and reported his wife, Doreen, missing. Stephen told officers that he hadn't seen Doreen since March 29th, two days earlier. As the investigation unfolded, detectives concluded that Doreen was most likely murdered. But they never found Doreen's body, and subsequently, no one was ever charged in her disappearance. It's been 35 years since Doreen went missing, and her case is still open. Hey everyone, welcome back to Detective Perspective. My name is Derek Lavasser. I'm a former police detective and licensed private investigator. Each week I'll be covering an unsolved case in story format. I'll give you my perspective on the investigation and provide contact information for the individuals or organizations connected to the case so that if you have any leads, you can contact them directly. So this is an interesting case this week, and the reason I was drawn to it is, as you will notice, it's it takes place in Johnston, Rhode Island which if, for those of you who don't know, I am from Rhode Island. So small state, uh, we don't have a ton of murder here. So it's always interesting to see or hear about a case that's from your hometown and you start to hear about certain streets or areas that are mentioned and, you, and you're familiar with them. You've been there numerous times. So it, it adds another layer to the case. Uh, this was one I had never heard of before. Uh, there's a lot of cases that have happened back before I became a police officer that I haven't heard of, but this was an interesting one. And it, it's fascinating to see one of these cases where you feel like you know what happened, but unfortunately no one was ever charged. However, you may feel differently. So we're going to go over the facts of the case today and uh, we're going to get uh, your feelings on it. You can weigh down uh, below, which is, I guess, a good segue here. As you guys know, this is a new channel for me. So if you're interested in true crime, more specifically unsolved cases being told in this way from someone who's worked cases like this, I would really appreciate you considering subscribing to the channel. And if you're listening on audio, whether it's Apple Podcast or Spotify, um, you can subscribe to the show. And if it's Apple Podcast, you can actually leave a review. You guys know how the algorithm works. The more people who rate it, review it, um, it gets moved up in the chart. People see it. We get more exposure for the show, which ultimately leads to more exposure for these cases. All right, I think we got everything out of the way. Let's dive into the case. In 1976, 21 year old Doreen Dobson met 27 year old bodybuilder and father of two, Stephen Marfio. They quickly bonded over their mutual love of being active and outgoing, and it wasn't long before the two were dating. Those who knew Doreen felt like Stephen was a perfect match for her. The couple married in 1978 and settled in a home on Hartford Avenue in Johnston, Rhode Island, a small town west of Providence. Stephen worked as an electroplater at a jewelry manufacturing firm, while Doreen took a position as a clerk at the Rhode Island School of Design. Doreen's reputation for being punctual, organized, and highly efficient led to her rise through the ranks, eventually landing her a role as purchasing manager at the school. But then in the fall of 1989, Doreen abruptly quit her job after working at the school for a decade. Her coworkers were surprised by her resignation, as they all thought she had a promising future there. Doreen's reason for quitting is not completely clear. According to several articles, Doreen left the school because she needed to quit to work on her marriage. At the time, things with Stephen were a little rocky. The Providence Journal reported that Stephen had become aggressive and jealous. He seemed to keep tabs on Doreen at all times. He would call her at work to check up on her, and when she was visiting with her mother, he would call her there too. But according to Stephen, things were fine in the marriage. He claimed that Doreen actually quit her job because she was stressed and frustrated with her position, not because they needed to work on things. Stephen also stated that Doreen's resignation was a surprise to him and everyone she knew. Stephen later told Unsolved Mysteries that after Doreen quit her job in the fall of 1989, her behavior became very erratic. He explained that prior to her resignation, she had been strong and independent, but once she quit, she became weak and unsure of herself. Stephen said that it often seemed that Doreen was headed towards a nervous breakdown. Sometimes she would just cry and shake. If Stephen asked her a question about what was going on, she'd become very stubborn. He'd beg her to talk to him, but she would say she couldn't talk about it at that moment and that she would tell him what was going on later. According to Stephen, this behavior continued for another six months until Doreen disappeared. 
He said he never found out what actually was going on with his wife. On March 31st, 1990, six months after Doreen's erratic behavior allegedly began, Stephen called Doreen's mother, Laura, and asked if she had heard from Doreen. Laura told Stephen that she hadn't heard from Doreen and that she was supposed to call her on the 29th, but she never did. Laura then asked Stephen to call the police, which he did. He reported 30-year-old Doreen missing that day. Stephen told the Johnston police that the last time he saw Doreen was during a lunch break on March 29th. He explained that when he went home for lunch that afternoon, Doreen was sitting on the couch watching TV. When he left, everything seemed fine. Stephen said that he returned home from work at around 4 p.m. After he went inside, he realized Doreen wasn't there. This was a big surprise to Stephen as her car was still in the driveway. He checked to see if Doreen had left a note behind, but she hadn't. Stephen looked around to see if Doreen had taken anything with her. Her two cats were still at home, but a small suitcase, jeans, and a few blouses were gone. So was Doreen's handbag and visa card. Next, Stephen opened up the couple's safe and found that Doreen had also taken around $600 in cash. Aside from these items, nothing else seemed to be missing from the home. When asked why he waited so long to report Doreen missing, Stephen claimed that he thought Doreen needed some time to herself. He mentioned that she had been acting erratically since she quit her job six months earlier. After Stephen reported Doreen missing, detectives went to the Marfio home to look around. They didn't find a sign of a struggle or a violent encounter. The Boston Herald reported that detectives also spoke to Doreen's friends and family. None of them had been in contact with her and they had no idea where she could be. Detectives reached out to local hospitals, airlines, and taxis, but none of them had any record of seeing Doreen. They also looked into Doreen's visa card and didn't find any activity. In fact, they found that the couple had $50,000 in cash, which had been left untouched. Finally, detectives looked into the possibility that either Doreen or Steven were having an affair, but they didn't find anything that would suggest they were. By mid-May, detectives had no solid leads in Doreen's disappearance. According to Unsolved Mysteries, there were several tips about people who thought they had seen Doreen. However, detectives were unable to confirm these sightings were actually Doreen. On May 21st, Stephen announced a $5,000 reward for any information leading to Doreen. That day, detectives told the Boston Herald that while there were no leads, they found it really hard to believe that Doreen would have left her mother, who she was very close to. Laura lived by herself and struggled with arthritis, so Doreen would either visit or call Laura every Saturday without fail. Detectives found it very unlikely that Doreen would leave Laura behind willingly. Even with the reward, the case continued to stall through the rest of May. Then in June, the Johnston police received two typed, undated anonymous letters. The first letter is difficult to make out due to the fading ink, but Unsolved Mysteries reported that the author claimed Doreen had been having several affairs with people she worked with. The author listed the names of those co-workers as well. The letter went on to read in part, quote, although on the outside she personifies class, beauty, and professionalism, in reality she is nothing more than a cheap harlot. Another line said, quote, her promotions were achieved by her sexual prowess rather than her management or leadership abilities. Detectives spoke to the co-workers who had been mentioned. All of them were surprised that they had been named and they all denied having an affair with Doreen. The second letter described in shorthand what happened to Doreen on the day she went missing. It read, quote, regarding Doreen Marfio, missing person. Stephen Marfio left his workplace, drove home to have lunch with his wife. There was no lunch. Doreen sleeping on couch in living room. Stephen got hot under the collar. He made for the couch and strangled Doreen. Stephen acted fast. He stuffed Doreen's shoes and handbag in a shopping bag and tied it around her waist. He wrapped the body in a blanket, secured it with clothesline rope. He deposited body illegible. Marfio got in car, crossed the Providence line. Two miles on narrow dirt road, he stopped and deposited wife's body in reeds in a pond. Marfio returned to work, a flat tire excuse for extended lunch hour. Marfio home at 4 p.m., on the phone calling police reporting his wife missing. Marfio is highly skilled in the fine art of deception. He can make a lie hear the ring of truth. Johnston detectives theorized that Stephen was the one who wrote both letters. They later told Unsolved Mysteries that they thought Stephen was the author because the letters contained information only he could have known. The detectives had other reasons to be suspicious of Stephen. At some point, they looked at his time cards at work from March 29, 1990, and found that he took a 70-minute lunch break instead of his normal 20 to 30 minutes. At another point, Stephen told detectives that for 11 months prior to Doreen's disappearance, he hired private investigators to follow her around. 
He said he did this because of Doreen's bizarre behavior after quitting her job. He was concerned and thought something was wrong with her. Detectives thought it was odd that Stephen hired people to follow Doreen around for almost a year. But when she disappeared, he waited two days before reporting her missing. It didn't seem like Stephen was being consistent. According to the Providence Journal, detectives eventually found out that Stephen hired private investigators because he thought Doreen was cheating on him, not because he was worried for her safety. None of the PIs found any evidence she was being unfaithful during the 11th month period she was being followed. However, it should be noted that Doreen's sister told Unsolved Mysteries that 10 years before her disappearance, Doreen did have an affair with another man. This guy wanted Doreen to leave Stephen and move away with him, but she decided to stick it out with Stephen. Now, by the way, this could, have, this could be the reason that even though it was 10 years prior, Stephen just never got over it and it was always in the back of his head which over the years probably led to this jealousy and this possessiveness that ultimately resulted in him hiring help to follow her around. Knowing all of this information, detectives were pretty sure Doreen had been murdered by Stephen, who was jealous and aggressive. The lead detective, John Nardolillo Jr., told the Providence Journal that he theorized Doreen told Stephen she was leaving him on March 29, 1990. Stephen did not take the news well and strangled Doreen in a fit of rage. He later removed her body from the home and buried her in an undisclosed location. Hoping to prove the letters were written by Stephen, detectives sent them off to be examined by Dr. Murray Myron, a professor in psycholinguistics at Syracuse University. After looking over everything, Dr. Myron concluded that Stephen was the author of both letters and had therefore most likely killed his wife. Based on Dr. Myron's findings, detectives seized multiple typewriters Stephen had access to. Unsolved Mysteries reported that they were able to determine that the first letter was written on a typewriter owned by Stephen's quote, close relative. It's unclear if they linked the second letter to Stephen as well. There was also no other information that suggested the letter was written on the same typewriter they had concluded the first letter had been written on. Detectives confronted Stephen about the letters. He then hired an attorney and stopped cooperating with police. No shock there. Unfortunately, linking one letter to Stephen wasn't enough to bring charges. Detectives continued investigating the case, chasing leads from North Carolina to Pennsylvania. They also worked with police departments in Arizona, California, Maine, and even the FBI. But by the one-year anniversary of Doreen's disappearance and suspected homicide, detectives were still at a standstill. They had no witnesses, no physical evidence, and no body. All they had were those two letters and a theory. Detective Nardalillo was so desperate for answers that he even consulted with psychics, something he rarely did. According to the Providence Journal, one psychic concluded that Doreen was alone in a cold, dark place. Detectives believed this to be true, but a psychic's visions are not admissible in court, so they were back at a standstill. Nardolillo told the journal that for the next few years, he and Stephen were, quote, locked in a psychological standoff. Nardolillo lost sleep at night, worried that Stephen was getting away with murder. On a few occasions, the men would pull up to the same stoplight. Every time this happened, they would just stare at each other until the light turned green. Other times, Nardolillo followed Stephen to his favorite breakfast place or drove by the Marfio home on Hartford Avenue. One day, Nardolillo saw Stephen in the home's driveway. He pulled over and asked, quote, do you think it's time to tell the truth about what happened to your wife? Stephen replied, quote, you're a nice guy, but you're in the wrong business. This interaction is absolutely fascinating to me. It almost seems like it would be something you would watch in a movie, but believe it or not, this can happen. Detectives work these cases and it's impossible not to have some personal connection to them. I have them with some of the cases that I've worked. So I can definitely see a world where this detective was uh, taking his work home with him and being from a small state like Rhode Island, I can tell you firsthand, <laughs> you do run into the people, the same people that you have arrested or may arrest in the future or have warrants out for. It happens all the time. This is why I wanted to cover this case in the first place because it's a local case and there are a lot of similarities to my own investigative experience when I was a police officer. Nardolillo was so obsessed with solving Doreen's case that he often worked nights and weekends without pay, hoping to find enough evidence to charge Stephen. On the other hand, Stephen felt like Nardolillo was railroading him, so he spoke to an attorney in the hopes of getting the detective to leave him alone. In 1993, three years after Doreen disappeared, Unsolved Mysteries covered the case. Stephen was interviewed for an episode during which he was asked if he wrote the letters to police. Stephen said he did not, and he was getting tired of the quote, allegations and accusations from the police. 
Stephen was also asked if he had anything to do with Doreen's disappearance. He replied, quote, I had nothing to do with my wife's disappearance, nor do I know where she is. I would like to think that she's still alive, but I do feel it's possible it could go the other way. But I want to know she's alive. Doreen's mother and sister spoke to Unsolved Mysteries as well. Doreen's mother said that the police tried to convince her that Stephen was involved, but she didn't think he was because every time the phone rang, he seemed like he got his hopes up that it was Doreen calling. Doreen's sister said that she didn't believe Stephen killed Doreen either, and neither did most of his friends. For years after the Unsolved Mysteries episode aired, there wasn't much reporting on Doreen's case. Stephen continued living in the same home he and Doreen shared before she disappeared, and eventually, he started dating Lori Vincent, a hairdresser and mother of two. According to Stephen's mother, Stephen quote, really liked Lori, but in the end, he wasn't ready to make a long-term commitment due to her children, so they broke up. It appears that they remained friendly because later on, Stephen purchased a car from Lori's new boyfriend, Sal. Uh, you'll see here that I'm leaving out Sal's last name, and you'll understand why very, very soon, but for his privacy, uh, we're purposely omitting his last name. By July 1999, Lori and Sal had been dating for around six months. Those who knew the couple said they seemed very happy. Stephen, on the other hand, wasn't doing as well. He told his family members that he was taking a vacation to quote, straighten out his head. Later, it would become clear that he was actually planning a double murder suicide. At around 10.15 p.m. on July 31st, police responded to Sal's home in North Providence for a report of a horn going off. Officers arrived and found a car parked in the driveway. When they looked inside, they found 38-year-old Lori dead in the passenger seat. She had been shot in the head several times. The officers then found 56-year-old Sal on a nearby stone wall, suffering multiple gunshot wounds to the head. He was conscious, but unresponsive. He was transported to the hospital for emergency surgery, and surprisingly, he eventually recovered. After finding Lori and Sal, police didn't have an immediate suspect in the shooting, so they canvassed the neighborhood. Based on the descriptions of the shooter and his car, police quickly identified their suspect as 50-year-old Stephen Marfio. At around 4.45 a.m. on what is now August 1st, Connecticut State Police found Stevens Pontiac Firebird near the Seville Dam in Barkhamsted, Connecticut, a wooded area around 100 miles away from North Providence. When police looked inside Stevens' car, they found him with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He was transported to the hospital, where he was declared dead a few hours later. According to the Associated Press, three guns were found in Stevens' car. An additional five were located at his friend's house. None of the guns had been registered. Detectives also seized ammunition and pepper spray from Stevens' belongings. In addition to searching Stevens' car and friend's home, detectives also searched the area where his car had been located. The Hartford Current reported that the dam seemed like an odd place for Steven to take his own life. He had no ties there, and the wooded area was, quote, very remote. It was not the type of area someone would just stumble upon. Detectives theorized that the area was possibly connected to Doreen's disappearance. Maybe Stephen chose to end his life where he buried Doreen's remains. It was a long shot, but detectives wanted to leave no stone unturned. On August 3rd, two days after Stephen was found, the Seville Dam area was searched with five dogs. The forest, the dam, and nearby lawns were secured for several hours, but they didn't find anything related to Doreen. At the same time the searches were going on, the media started reporting on Doreen's case again. Many articles questioned Stephen's possible role in Doreen's disappearance. At this point, Detective Nardalillo was still convinced Stephen was involved. He told the Hartford Current, quote, There's no doubt in my mind. I've been chasing this guy's tail for nine and a half years. But Stephen's mother still didn't believe her son was involved. She told the Current that Stephen had suffered a lot since Doreen went missing. Around a week after Stephen killed Laura, shot Sal, and took his own life, it was revealed that he had written a suicide note to his mother. The note was found in the car along with his will and funeral arrangements. Detectives had waited to let the public know about the letter until it was confirmed to be written by Stephen through handwriting analysis. The note read, quote, Hi mom, I know that you've known for a long time, ever since Doreen disappeared, that I'm not right, not the same person I used to be. And I know that I will never be. When she left, half of my heart, my reason for living and future plans went with her. I'm just a shell of a man faking I'm okay for the sake of my friends and you. I don't want you to worry, but it is out of your hands now. I know I don't have to worry about retiring 401ks or a pension. I knew I would not live to be an old person all of my life, but just recently, I realized I would die at my own hand. 
and unfortunately, I will take a couple of people with me. I know it's an insane thing to say, but I feel it's the only way it can be. I finally lost it. I don't want help. I must do what I have to do. Talking with a professional, you or my friends is not in the plans. I have committed myself to eliminate Sal, Lori, and me in that order. It's the only way the more I think about it, the stronger I feel that it's justified. I realize that this is a sick person talking, but I finally crossed over forever to the dark side. I'm not afraid to die. My life is over. I have nothing to live for. Probably near the end of the summer, and there's nothing anyone can do. You've been a perfect mother and I love you with all of my heart. It's just too painful to be here any longer. Don't blame yourself, I'm a big boy. I know I've lost it and I need help, but I choose not to. Because of my love for you, I've been around nine years longer than I should have been. Goodbye, Mom. I love you forever. Steve. Detective Nardalillo told the Providence Journal that detectives were disappointed Stephen didn't take responsibility for Doreen's disappearance. Despite the lack of confession, detectives were still adamant Stephen had been involved in Doreen's disappearance and possible murder. They decided to search the home that Stephen and Doreen had shared prior to Doreen disappearing. Detectives also continued searching the Seville Dam area for Doreen's remains. They told the public, quote, we're going to continue to exhaust every piece of physical evidence and information that we have before we put this case to rest. Before we put it back on the shelf, we just want to make sure that we did everything we could. But detectives didn't find Doreen's body or any evidence to solidify their theory. Pretty quickly, newspaper articles about the disappearance dwindled to almost nothing. One of the last articles written about Doreen's case was published in 2003. At the time, Detective Nardalillo told the publication that he saw Stephen's suicide as a last move in a battle for control. When he heard Stephen had taken his own life, he thought they would never find Doreen. Stephen's mother also interviewed for the article. She told the journal that she didn't know why Stephen killed Lori and shot Sal and then took his own life. She repeated that she didn't believe Stephen played a role in Doreen's disappearance, stating, quote, He was always good to me and good to his family. I don't think he killed Doreen. I just don't want to think about it. Doreen's mother, Laura, spoke to the Providence Journal as well. She told them she didn't think Stephen was responsible for Doreen's disappearance. Laura described how she remained close to Stephen until his death. She'd actually seen him on the day he killed Lori and shot Sal. During their last conversation, Laura told Stephen, quote, you two could have had such a wonderful life. Stephen replied, quote, I know. Laura also told the journal that on multiple occasions throughout the years, she asked Stephen point blank if he murdered Doreen. He always denied having any involvement. Laura said now that Stephen was dead, she couldn't judge him, only God could. She also stated that she was more concerned about finding Doreen so she could bury her than trying to figure out if Stephen was involved. And I, I can understand that. Ultimately, if Stephen's gone, your main priority is bringing your child home. So I get it. Laura, who was 89 years old at the time, said she never thought she'd be asking God to let her live longer, but she prayed every day for God to let her bury Doreen before she died. Unfortunately, Laura passed away without knowing what truly happened to her daughter. As of today, Doreen Marfio's disappearance is still unsolved and she's presumed dead. Now, a couple quick facts here. Doreen was a white female, 34 years old, 5'6", 110 pounds, with brown hair, green eyes, and a chicken pox mark on the front of her calf. Doreen was last seen on March 29, 1990 at her home on Hartford Avenue in Johnston, Rhode Island. And that brings us up to date on Doreen's case. It is important to note that we did reach out to the Johnston Police Department to see if they could provide any new updates. And unfortunately, they didn't have any. So that brings us to my perspective on this investigation. And there's a, and there's a few things to go over. First off, the obvious, the quote unquote erratic behavior that was described by Stephen at the beginning of this case, because that kind of sets up this whole reason for her disappearing, right? And according to him, I think this one for most of you, you guys picked up on nobody else witnessed this behavior, not her friends, not her family, not her coworkers. As I said in the beginning, th they were surprised to hear her quit her job just out of nowhere. And I think that's because she knew there was a lot going on at home. Maybe she even knew about the, the PIs that were following her, but she, she really wanted to make it work. So she was trying to stay home more often, but Regardless, it wasn't going to help the level of jealousy that that Stephen had, and she didn't know this was where this was going to lead. But unfortunately, she was trying to make a valid effort to to get it better. But unfortunately, that wasn't going to work out. As far as the items, again, same type of thing. Her a couple pieces of clothing, a Visa card, some cash. 
who's to say for sure that those items were taken? The only person there was Steven. And the fact that the visa card was never used uh, is suggestive that Doreen didn't take off on the run. She couldn't live or survive or f off $600. And if she was really going to just flee the state, she probably would have taken some of that money to get her on her feet to at least establish a new life. And finally, as the detectives pointed out, Laura, Doreen's mom, she had arthritis and she had a very close relationship with Doreen. She wasn't completely reliant on her, but they had a close relationship. And I think if Doreen was leaving Stephen, she would have given her mom some indication she might have taken her with her, but or at least she would have said goodbye. None of that uh, turned out to be the case. Now let's get into the letters. First letter, to me, it seems like someone who was jealous, uh, possessive, envious of maybe of maybe the life that Doreen was living. And it does appear that it could have been a coworker or more than likely the person writing the letter wanted to believe it was potentially a coworker. The second letter does contain some guilt knowledge. There's some specifics in there about what potentially happened to Doreen. And as detective said, again, there was information about the crime, you know, about the crime scene, her house, um, that only Steven would have known unless he told someone else, no one else would have had access to the inside of that home. What's interesting about it is if he wasn't planning on confessing, why write a letter implicating himself? That's the one thing I'm a little perplexed by, but maybe it was an ego thing. Maybe uh, him and Detective Nardalillo really didn't like each other and he was playing this cat and mouse game with him. I don't know. That part doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but there was information in that letter that only, only Stephen would have, which again is suggestive that he was involved, at minimum involved, probably solely responsible. Next, I want to talk about Stephen's behavior leading up to Doreen's disappearance, because as I mentioned in the previous thing here about the letters, first letter describes someone who was possessive, aggressive, jealous, maybe. Well, his behavior leading up to her disappearance was displaying the exact behavior. If you're someone who believes that your spouse is cheating on you, it's a and I do PI investigations all the time. I own a PI firm. We don't do a lot of infidelity cases. We used to do more. Personally, I just don't like them. They're messy. But when I would do them there's a financial constraint to it, right? And usually it's for a very short period of time where the, the client will tell us, hey, I think my significant other is going to be out with someone on this occasion, so I need you for these hours. And that's really it. There's a specific event that we're monitoring or maybe at most a week or two. That's it. To have PIs following your wife for 11 months is not suggestive of you knowing that she's cheating on you. It's suggestive that you just want to keep tabs on her. You have this control over her and you want to make sure that no one takes your possession, comes into her life who is better than you. And that's the other fear with this whole person be, who is jealous and possessive. They're self-conscious about themselves and they know that she could do better. So they want to make sure she doesn't interact with anyone because she may realize that she deserves better. That's what it sounds like to me here. Okay, now we got to turn our attention to some of the facts, which are really critical in this case. Detectives were able to pull time cards for, for Stephen, and they could see that his break was usually 20 to 30 minutes. But on March 29th, the day that Doreen disappeared, coincidentally, he was gone for 70 minutes. He didn't tell people beforehand that that would be the case. This was some random thing that happened, which is suggestive that what was written in the letter did in fact happen. He goes home. He doesn't like what Doreen's doing. There's an altercation. He strangles her. He leaves her there. He doesn't transport her body at that point. He goes back to work. And then after completing his day at work, he then removes her body from the home and transports it somewhere else. The second part of this is the Seville Dam. You know, some people say this is this way may be where Doreen was buried and that's why he went out there. It's possible. I would think that with the, the canines out there, with all the police presence, they would have found something, a disturbed area that might suggest someone was buried there. They could have missed it. It's it, it's easier than it sounds. However, the argument at the beginning was this isn't just some place you would stumble upon. Well, then I would pose the question: If that's the case, if he did kill Doreen, why would he why would he take her to the Seville Dam? How did he know about it? Why wouldn't he take her somewhere in Rhode Island? There's a lot of places here you can bury a body. I, it's happened over the years. They're still finding bodies in old buildings and under construction sites to this day. Why go all the way out to Connecticut? I don't, I don't know why. So yes, it could suggest that that's where Doreen was buried, but I also think that it could be he was fleeing the area, he was driving on the highway, probably 95, 
and just randomly pulled off this exit and stumbled on this location. And when he got there, he said, this is the place. This is where it's happening. To me, in my mind, that's equally j just as likely as there was some deeper significance about it. Unless there's information that they have, police that is, that they haven't shared with us that would suggest the Seville Dam would be a location where he would have brought Doreen. Maybe they had some ties there before. That's also possible. But based on what we know, it could go one way or the other. And my final note for this week's episode is the suicide note. Uh, this was a letter written to Stephen's mom. This wasn't intended for police, although I'm sure he assumed they were going to see it. But at that point, you really don't care. This was his final words to the, to the person he probably loved the most in his life. So some of you may say, hmm, it's, it's weird that he would confess to the idea that he was going to kill these other people, but not confess to killing Doreen. Well, to me, that's perfectly reasonable. He wants his mom to remember him in a positive light. She's not going to care too much about Lori or Sal, but she had a relationship with Doreen. She knew her and he had told her over the years that he had nothing to do with Doreen's disappearance. The last thing he would want is for his mother to view him in a way where everything she, he had told her throughout the years was a lie. And in fact, he was a murderer. He was a monster. He was a controlling person, not only with Doreen, but with every element of his life. And he wanted to control the narrative as he left this earth specifically with his mother. And that is why when he tells this story, it's not a story where he's admitting to all of his wrongs. He's painting himself as the victim here and that people should feel bad for him and that he's the one who's suffering because he lost his wife and was unfairly blamed for it for all of these years. That's what I think Stephen did. So for me, I do believe Stephen was involved in Doreen's disappearance and, and her homicide. And I think where we stand with this case is there's probably not too much more that can be done. We're in a situation where the main suspect is dead and a lot of the witnesses or people who could be involved, coworkers, things like that are getting older, their memories change. So as far as where we go from here, as far as the investigation is concerned, there's not a ton. However, there is something. And that's where we're going to end this case, because as always, I'm going to provide you with the contact information for the individuals or the police departments involved. And in this case, there is something you can help with. If you have any information about Doreen's case, you can contact the Johnston Police Department at 401-231-4210. In addition to tips, detectives are searching for blood relatives of Doreen. So if you're related to her, please call that number. That's going to conclude this week's case. I want to thank you guys for, for joining me. This is our second episode uh, we're going to get better as we go. I'm trying to find that rhythm, that format. So bear with me as I as I kind of figure out my voice, figure out my way. Um, but if you made it to the end of the video, I just want to thank you. I really do appreciate your support. If you're watching on YouTube, please you know leave a comment down below to let me know you made it to the end of the video and let me know what you think about the case. If you're listening on a podcast platform, please leave a rating, leave a review. It really helps the channel. It helps us get into the algorithm. It helps us grow. All right. That's going to do it for me, guys. I appreciate you being here. Everyone have a good night. Stay safe out there.